If you clicked on this video, chances are you're dealing with nail fungus or you know someone that is and you want to help them. So today we're going to talk all about nail fungus, its causes and how to treat it. I'm Dr. Sam Ellis. I'm a board certified medical and cosmetic dermatologist in Northern California. And I'm here to help you understand your skin and your hair and today your nails and to help you find products that work for you. So if that sounds good, give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. As I always mentioned, this is not personal medical advice. If you are concerned about a fungal nail or any issue with your nails, it's really important to consult with your personal healthcare provider. So let's just dive right into it. The term onychomycosis is what we use in dermatology to refer to a fungal nail infection. Onico means nail and mycosis means fungal, so together, fungal nail. And the reason I really wanted to discuss fungal, discolored, yellow, thickened toenails is not just because they can be painful or uncomfortable or difficult to take care of, but also because they cause a lot of social strife. When I'm treating fungal nails, in my office, the biggest complaint people have is not about the discoloration or the discomfort, it's really about how it makes them feel and their confidence. So oftentimes people feel like they have a really good sense of when they have a fungal infection in their nail. And there are many signs you can look for. So thickening of the nail, yellowing of the nail, something called subungual hyperkeratosis, which is essentially thickening with kind of a crumbly texture under the nail. Those are all signs of onychomycosis. Other things you might notice are whitish discoloration of the nail, redness or swelling around the nail itself. And oftentimes when people have nail fungus, they will also have foot fungus going on at the same time, which often looks like redness or just scaliness of the feet in between the toes. And of course, it's important to mention this can affect the toenails or the fingernails, but the toes are just much more commonly infected with fungus than the fingernails. And this really just has to do with the environment that they're in. They're in a moist, covered, occlusive environment in your shoes. They get more traumatized. And those are all things that sort of predispose you to developing fungal infections. Now, just because your nails are thickened and yellowed or are growing out in an irregular way, it doesn't necessarily mean you have a nail infection or onychomycosis. There are things that can mimic that. So for example, inflammatory skin conditions such as lichen planus or psoriasis can be associated with dystrophic, also known as irregularly growing nails. Trauma alone can cause the nail to grow out irregularly. And the other thing worth mentioning is trauma will also predispose you to nail infection. So you can have trauma and nail fungus going on at the same time. Other things that can cause the nails to look irregular or grow out in a way that mimics onychomycosis includes warts, under the nail or around the nail, as well as certain skin cancers like squamous cell carcinoma and melanoma of the nail unit. There's also something called subungual exostosis, which is essentially a bony outgrowth from the bone that sits under the nail, and that can cause the nail overlying it to grow out and look irregular. Now, if it is a true fungal infection or onychomycosis, we think of three classes of fungal organisms that lead to this. One is dermatophytes. These are sort of classic fungal organisms that infect the skin, the hair, and the nails. You can have an infection with non-dermatophyte molds. So mold organisms live in the environment pretty much everywhere. And anytime a nail is traumatized, a mold is able to infect it. And then you can also have infections with yeast like candida. Now, just know if you're struggling with fungal nails, onychomycosis is the most common nail disorder that we see in clinical practice, both in primary care and in dermatology. It also affects over 5% of the world population. So if you're dealing with an unusual nail, just know you are not alone. Now, there are certainly things that make you more prone to developing nail fungus. So let's just spend a second talking about the risk factors for this condition. Number one is going to be age. This is much more common in older individuals, especially after the age of 60. And then, like I mentioned before, trauma to the nail is going to increase your risk of developing fungus. Essentially, you're changing the architecture of that nail with trauma, and that makes it a more hospitable place for fungus to inhabit. And trauma comes in many forms. It could just be like repeated walking and sort of stubbing your toes into the front of your shoes, or it could be dropping something heavy on your foot and just sort of having a one-time traumatic event. Other things that increase your risk of developing onychomycosis include having foot fungus, and we'll talk about this when we get to treatments, but it is so important that if you're trying to get rid of fungal nails that you're treating any fungus that's on your body. And then there are other health conditions that predispose you to foot fungus. So those include things like diabetes, obesity, immunosuppression because of a medical condition or drugs that you might be taking to treat that medical condition, as well as inflammatory skin disorders, like I mentioned before, such as psoriasis and lichen planus. So those not only can give you an irregular looking nail, but they can also predispose you to developing fungus in those nails. And something else that is important to note is there is a very strong genetic risk factor when it comes to being predisposed to developing fungal nails. So it's not passed down genetically. You don't inherit the fungus, but you inherit the ability to catch the fungus. And 
that's one of the reasons why you will often see people who live in the same household develop nail fungus. It's not just because they're exposed to one another, but if there's a genetic link between those individuals, they're at a more increased risk because of that as well. Now, I know we're here chatting on YouTube about fungal nails, but I wanna give you some tips if you're going to the dermatologist to have your nails evaluated, because I feel like you wanna be able to get the most out of that visit, and this is how. So first, if you're going to be evaluated for a nail issue, that should really be the main focus of that appointment. You don't wanna have a full body skin check and an acne follow-up and your nails evaluated in the same visit. That will stress your dermatologist out, but more importantly, it will not allow you to have the time and attention paid to your nails that it deserves. So to me, a nail complaint is a separate appointment done on its own. Additionally, you're going to wanna to come to the dermatologist with no nail polish on. I cannot tell you how many people come in for nail complaints and they're wearing acrylic nails or they have nail polish on, come in with bare clean nails. The other thing is plan to have them look at all of your nails, your fingernails and your toenails. Even if you just have a toenail complaint, they're going to want to examine your fingernails. And if you just have a fingernail complaint, they're going to want to look at your feet as well. So you need to make sure all of your nails are ready to be examined. The other thing is you actually don't want to clip your nails before your dermatology appointment. A lot of people think, oh, I'm going to the derm. I want to shave and clean up and clip my nails. If you're going for a nail complaint, you don't want to do that because if we think you might have a nail fungus, one of the things we'll do is we will send a nail clipping to be evaluated for infection. And if you have just trimmed your nails, which unfortunately happens from time to time, we actually have to wait for the nail to grow out before we can get an adequate sample to send. And for an adequate nail sample, we want at least two to three millimeters. So if you think of like a grain of rice and the width of that, that is the minimum amount of nail sample we wanna take. We'll also usually scrape a little bit of debris from under the nail as well. And even if you've just showered, if you have a fungal nail infection, we'll be able to get some debris out of there because the fungus lives in the nail, not under the nail. Also, if you have previously been treating your nails for fungus with either topical or oral medications, we typically want a three to six month washout period, meaning a three to six month period where you have not used any antifungal medication in or on your nails so that we can make sure we have an adequate, appropriate sample that's going to yield the results we're looking for. You also wanna to come to your appointment with a little bit of patience because when you are culturing a nail for fungus, it can take up to four weeks to see that fungus grow. So it might be a little while before you have your results and can initiate treatment. All right, I think this is a good time for us to move on to fungal nail treatments. So before you initiate fungal nail treatment, no matter what you're using, prescription medication, over-the-counter, homeopathic or home remedies, one thing that's important to recognize is that fungus is incredibly stubborn. It will often form something called a biofilm, which is essentially like a protective shield or matrix that the fungal organisms live within, within the nail, which can make it more challenging for oral and topical medications to penetrate and be effective. Also, even after you initiate treatment for fungal nails, it can take a long time to see results. So we're looking at six months minimum when you're treating toenails to begin to see results and probably up to 18 months before you grow out a normal nail. And that's just because toenails grow really slowly, one to two millimeters max a month. So you can imagine if you initiate treatment, it would take a while before you see a normal nail growing out. Luckily, fingernails grow about three times faster than toenails. So if you have a fungal infection in your fingernail, you're probably going to see results more quickly. It's also worth noting that a cure from fungal nails is not always possible. If there is severe irreparable damage to the nail or the nail matrix, which is where the nail grows from, sometimes that trauma is always going to predispose you to nail fungus and that fungus is very hard to eradicate. Also, if you have an ongoing medical condition like obesity, diabetes, or immunosuppression, you may never be able to fully be cleared of the fungal nail because that medical condition is ongoing. And then ultimately treatment is always going to be tailored to the specific patient. Advancing age also decreases the ability to cure someone of a nail infection. So past the age of 70 or so, you're more likely to have multiple organisms infecting the nail. There's also slower nail growth. There might be poor blood flow or circulation to the foot and toes or to the fingers. And ultimately it makes it harder to clear an infection, which is why, and I'll talk about this in a second, if you have nail fungus, I recommend treating it sooner rather than later. And ultimately treatment is going to be based on the specific patient what your nails look like, what are their comorbidities or other medical conditions you have, what organism is growing there, what the cost of that treatment might be, and what makes sense for you to incorporate into your life or lifestyle. So the number one most effective, best way, highest chance of cure to get rid of fungal nails is with systemic or oral medications. And these are widely used to treat onychomycosis because they are the most effective, they are low cost and low risk. 
And I'll get to risk in a second because I think one of the main reasons people shy away from taking oral medications for fungal nails is because they're worried about the risks and side effects. And I definitely want to address that. But first, let's talk about the medications themselves. So the two medications approved by the FDA for the treatment of onychomycosis are terbinafine and itraconazole. So the most commonly used oral antifungal medication is terbinafine, also known as Lamisil. It's also available in topical formulations, which we will get to as well. This is active against many different types of fungus. It also treats some molds and kills yeast. Terbinafine offers the highest chance of cure. So about 75% of people who take this medication for 12 weeks, which is how you take it for your toenails, or six weeks, which is how long you take it for your fingernails, will have what we call a mycologic cure. Or if you go in and cut the nail and resample it afterward, that's the chance that they will have been cured of the fungus. Now, mycologic cure, which happens 75% of the time with terbinafine, is different than complete cure. And that is where you have a clinically normal appearing nail. And that only happens about 38% of the time for the toenails and 59% of the time for fingernails. So that is something I'm very clear about with patients is even if you take an oral medication and you clear the fungus out, the chance that you have a 100% normal looking nail for your toes is under 50%. Now, if you don't have complete cure, that can be for a variety of reasons. One, you might have multiple organisms affecting the nail and it only killed off some of them. You might have some sort of trauma that had already happened to the nail that makes it look unusual. So that could be a reason why the nail continues to grow out irregularly, or there could be small amounts of fungus that are still harbored in there that the medication essentially just can't reach because of that abnormal architecture. So one of the reasons I find that people might be hesitant to take an oral medication like terbinafine to treat their nail fungus is there's not a 100% chance of cure. And the other reason I find that people are hesitant to take terbinafine is because of the potential side effects. So let's talk about those next. So I think it's important when you're talking about side effects to talk about sort of two different categories. And this is what I do with my patients as well. There are common side effects, the things that you are most likely to experience, but aren't necessarily dangerous. And then there are dangerous or life-threatening side effects, which even if they are exceedingly rare, I think are important to mention and discuss with patients taking medication. So let's talk about common side effects of terbinafine. And it's kind of weird to say common because they actually aren't very common. I prescribe this medication all the time. And it is so rare that someone has to stop a medication because of one of these side effects, but they are more common than what I'm about to talk about. So things like headaches, stomach upset. So that could be a little bit of a gurgly tummy or some diarrhea or nausea, taste disturbances. So a metallic taste in the mouth can happen with terbinafin, visual disturbances like dizziness or double vision. Again, quite rare. And then rarely people also develop something like a rash or an increase in their liver enzymes when taking this medication. And the thing I want to note about an increase in liver enzymes is that doesn't necessarily mean that is bad for your liver or hurting your liver or causing any long-term damage to your liver. It just means that if you were to take a blood test on someone taking terbinafine, you might notice a slight bump in their liver labs. The same way your liver labs might bump if you drank alcohol for a couple days in a row or you exercise really vigorously. Now let's talk about the rare side effects because these are the things that patients are really more concerned about. And the number one thing people ask about is liver toxicity or the risk of liver failure when taking terbinafine. So this is incredibly, incredibly rare. It's estimated that it happens in one in 50,000 up to one in 120,000 people. So that is a super rare side effect. Now, it doesn't matter how rare it is, it's still scary to think about. So I totally understand why people would be hesitant to take a medication that has this even as a possibility. But I'll also tell you that you probably take medications every single day or quite regularly that have the same, if not greater risks. So things like aspirin, Advil, Tylenol, birth control, these things all have big risks too that may be even more life-threatening. Now, the interesting thing about this liver failure that happens with terbinafin is it's not very predictable. It wouldn't only affect someone who already has liver problems. It could happen to literally anyone and it happens spontaneously. So that's why we actually don't track someone's liver labs throughout the course of taking this medication. That used to be an old school thing that we did, but now with what we understand in the data, we usually get baseline liver labs. And if those are okay, we don't recheck them because if someone's going to have liver failure, there's nothing that you're going to see in the labs ahead of time to make you stop the medication and decrease that risk. So I always will counsel my patients on the signs of liver failure if I'm prescribing this medication and I actually give them a handout so they can reference it as well. But this will include things like nausea and vomiting, right upper quadrant pain, yellowing of the skin and eyes, also known as jaundice, pale stools or really dark or tea or Coca-Cola colored urine. Other very rare things that can happen when taking terbinafine include bone marrow suppression. So for example, a drop in your white blood cell count or a drop in your platelets, which help your blood to clot. Also things like hearing loss and severe skin rashes, including drug-induced lupus can happen. 
So I know this sounds really scary and I never bring this stuff up to talk people into or out of taking terbinafine. I think it's just a really important conversation to have. And it's really not as dangerous as discussing the side effects makes it seem, but I really think it's important that patients are making informed decisions about their personal health and really prioritizing what matters to them. To put this in a little bit of perspective, if I were to get diagnosed with toenail fungus, I would 100% take terbinafin. So of course that is a discussion that you are going to wanna have with your dermatologist or whoever is prescribing your antifungal medication. But let's talk a little bit about topical therapies as well, because sometimes I'll bring up those side effects and talk about terbinafin in depth, and then the patient is like, Never mind. Now I will say topical therapy for fungal nail infections is so, so, so much less effective. And these are usually topical lacquers that have antifungal medications in them that you must apply every single day for 48 consecutive weeks to see results. So that is almost an entire year of regular application and the cure rate is under 20%. And for most of these topicals, it's actually under 10%. The other thing is because of the low cure rate, a lot of insurances will not cover the cost of that topical medication, and it can be hundreds and hundreds of dollars out of pocket. So then probably the most common prescription topical is Cyclopyrox 8% nail lacquer. And that's the one that has an under 10% chance of cure. But regardless, a lot of patients still ask for it. And I've actually had many patients over the years do it religiously and do well with it. Now, the thing with that is you have to apply it to a clean nail. So it also means you're not applying nail polish for essentially at least a year. There are also prescription nail solutions that are applied to the nail and around the nail. One is afiniconazole, the other is tavabarol, and neither of these have very good cure rates either. So if a patient specifically requests this, I'm happy to prescribe it. I'm just very clear about what the cost might be as well as the success rate. And the whole reason why topical treatments are not nearly as effective for treating nail fungus as oral medications are is because when you have a nail infection with fungus, it is not just in the nail plate itself, it's usually also in the nail matrix, which is where the nail grows out from. And anything you're applying topically is not penetrating to the nail matrix where most of the fungus is residing. Also, a lot of these topical solutions don't penetrate the plate itself very well. So if you have very superficial fungus, you're good. But if you have fungus deep in the plate or under the plate, it's much harder to treat without using a systemic medication. In addition to having prescription oral medications and prescription topical antifungals to treat onychomycosis, there are also some home remedies that you can try. As a dermatologist, I'm not usually the biggest fan of home remedies. I very much believe in modern medicine, but at the same time, I've had many patients over the years have success with these home remedies. And if it saves on cost and they're willing to do it, because usually these take a little bit longer to be successful, I'm all for it. As long as they're not going to hurt themselves, they can definitely go for it. Now, if you look online, you will see a ton of different options for at-home remedies, but I would say the two that are most likely to give you success are either Listerine or using Vicks VapoRub. And if you are using Listerine, you want to make sure it's the yellow Listerine because that has thymol, as does Vicks VapoRub. And thymol Thymol has antifungal properties. If you're using Listerine, you're going to soak your nails for at least 10 minutes a day, and you're going to do that every single day. Or if you're using the Vicks VapoRub, you're applying that to the nails every single day for months. Oregano oil also has thymol in it, so that is also a common home remedy for nail fungus. There's also some evidence that tea tree oil might be helpful for nail fungus. We often use it for antifungal properties in scalp products, but you can try applying that to the nails as well. If you've had success with any home remedies for treating fungal nails, or you've had success with prescription medication, definitely let me know in the comments below. One thing I probably should have mentioned in the beginning is that when you're looking for improvement of your nails, when you are treating nail fungus, whether it's your fingernails or your toenails, you have to realize that whatever treatment you're doing is not going to transform the nail plate that you currently have. That is dead nail tissue. Anything that you do to treat fungus there is not going to affect that. What we're looking for is from the base of the nail, which is called the proximal nail fold, any outgrowth after you start treatment should be clear. So a lot of times people will come in and only half their nail will be improved, like the area closest to the cuticle, and they'll go, Dr. Ellis, I don't think it's working. It's totally working. It's just that healthy, clear nail is making its way out and you have to be clipping off the fungal nail as you go. So we covered oral prescription medication, topical prescription medication, home remedies. I just wanna give a brief note on in-office treatments for nail fungus because I get asked about this a lot. Probably one of the most common questions I get about treating nail fungus is, hey, you're a cosmetic dermatologist. You use a lot of lasers in your practice. Do you use lasers to treat nail fungus? Because I've heard of that before. And the answer is no, I do not. And really the reason for that is the chance of cure with laser treatment is very, very low. And if you've had laser treatment for your fungal nails, definitely put it in the comments below. I love hearing people's experiences. But what I found in practice and also what has been reported in the medical literature is that there is a very low success rate and these treatments can be very expensive, ranging from 
400 to $1,500 per treatment, and they are often not covered by insurance because they are less effective than both topical and oral medication. Another in-office treatment for fungal nails is something called photodynamic therapy or PDT. We often use this to treat precancers on people's skin, on their faces and on their arms, but similar to laser treatments, it's not often covered by insurance and it has a low cure rate. Essentially what you're doing with PDT or photodynamic therapy is you are applying a sensitizing medication called Levulon to the nail, and then you are putting it under blue light, which activates that medication and causes a chemical reaction that can in turn kill off the fungus. So this has potential to be successful, but it's just very poorly studied. And so it's not something that I offer in my practice, even though I do a lot of PDT or blue light therapy for precancers. So those I would say are sort of your treatment options, but we should also talk about prevention because even if you clear yourself of nail fungus, if you caught it once, you can catch it again. And we should talk about preventing a relapse. It's estimated that the relapse rate after clearing yourself of fungal nails is about 25%. So it's a real risk and it's important to kind of protect against that. And we know that that relapse rate is lower if you're taking preventative or proactive measures. So let's discuss. So in addition to treating your foot or nail fungus, it's really important that you treat any household members as well. And I understand that you don't always have control over who you share your home with and what they do with their body. But if you can get other members of the home to treat their fungal nails or their foot fungus, the chance that you catch it again goes down. It's also really important to just keep your feet cool and dry. Moist, occluded environments are really a breeding ground for fungus and bacteria. So if you can avoid wearing closed toed shoes when you don't need to, for example, if you go to the gym and you exercise in your sneakers, taking them off as soon as you get home is a really good idea. You also can catch fungus from public places or spaces. So wearing flip flops in public pools or locker rooms can also be protective. Another thing that's important to do, and this is always something I get a little bit of pushback on because it's not the most convenient, is to get rid of your infected shoes. So if you have really stinky and really stinky shoes can be a sign of having foot fungus or bacteria in your shoes, it's probably time to toss them. It's very hard to wash shoes and totally get rid of the fungus. There are some solutions out there, but they're not amazing. So if you have really old hiking boots or running shoes, trade up. In addition to not wearing occlusive shoes for longer than you have to, I also recommend purchasing some type of moisture wicking socks that aren't going to keep your feet hot and sweaty. So some of my favorites for this are Bombas. I also really like smart wool socks and I can link those in the description box. In addition to protecting your nails from other fungal exposures, you also wanna protect them from trauma. So you wanna keep your nails nice and short so they're not damaged and they're not running into the front of your shoes, for example. And if you get fungus in your fingernails, you wanna make sure you're not picking at or probing under your nails. If it's difficult for you to trim your own toenails, getting set up with a podiatrist who can regularly do nail care for you can be really helpful, or you can get a pedicure. Ideally, I wouldn't recommend that you go and get a pedicure if you have active nail fungus, just out of respect for other people who get services at that salon. But if you've treated your nail fungus and you want to get pedicures, but you're still a little bit hesitant about spreading it, you can bring your own tools with you. I would say probably the most important thing to do after you've treated nail fungus is to continue some type of topical antifungal thereafter. I usually recommend applying topical 1% terbinafen cream, also known as Lamisil. You can get this at any drugstore in sort of the foot fungus and jock itch aisle to the feet every single night for three months and then a couple times a week thereafter. When you're applying it, you don't just wanna apply it to the nails, but you wanna also apply it between the toes and on the feet because usually you have a little bit of foot fungus in addition to nail fungus. And a lot of times people will get foot fungus first and then that can turn into nail fungus. So you're preventing both with this. Another thing people will note is if they have fungal nails and they're on treatment, but they're trying to keep their nails short to avoid trauma and things like that, it can be very difficult to cut them. And if they can't get into a podiatrist, the next thing I recommend is applying 40% urea cream, which you can get over the counter to the nails for a few nights in a row. This really softens the nail and makes them much easier to trim. If you're struggling with fungal nails, I hope this video was helpful for you. I also wanna make it very clear that you don't have to treat your fungal nails. If they are not painful or bothersome or socially distressing, you don't have to do anything about them. Treatment of any condition is a very personal decision. But if you do try any of the things that I mentioned in this video and you have success, or even if you don't, please let me know in the comments as well. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel and I will see you next time.